Hey family, for week 18, we're going to tackle the big sick fish question in Mosiah 15, 1 through 4. How in the world can the Father and the Son be one God and also be two separate beings? So sit back, relax, enjoy the tank, and let's chat. Mosiah 15, 1 through 4 reads, And now Abinadi said unto them, I would that you should understand that God himself shall come down among the children of men and shall redeem his people. And because he dwelleth in flesh, he shall be called the Son of God, and having subjected the flesh to the will of the Father, being the Father and the Son. The Father, because he was conceived by the power of God, and the Son, because of the flesh, thus becoming the Father and the Son. And they are one God, yea, the very eternal Father of heaven and of earth. For me, this was one of those questions that bobbed like a sick fish in my spiritual aquarium. I have faith in the first vision, that Joseph Smith saw Heavenly Father and Jesus Christ both, side by side, two distinct and separate beings. Yet here, the Book of Mormon prophet Abinadi proclaims that the Father and the Son are one God, and in fact he goes to great lengths to explain how that's possible, in what might be the most confusing, unhelpful explanation I've ever read. This was one of those passages I always hated reading. I'd skim it quickly just to get past it, because I couldn't figure it out, which meant it was fuel for my skepticism, whether I wanted it to be or not. But avoiding what doesn't make sense only delays finding answers, so we're going to take this bull by the horns, with faith that it does make sense and it does teach truth, because Joseph Smith wasn't crazy and the Book of Mormon does indeed make sense and teach truth. In light of this month's new study skill, choosing a verse or principle and studying what modern day prophets have said about it, I thought, let's look at what the prophets have said about this one. Joseph Fielding Smith tackled this one head on. What's wrong with that scripture? What is a father? One who begets or gives life. What did our savior do? He begot us or gave us life from death. He became a father to us because he gave us immortality or eternal life through his death and sacrifice upon the cross. I think we have a perfect right to speak of him as father. King Mosiah put his people under covenant to take upon them the name of Christ, and this was 124 years before the birth of Christ. I want to read a verse or two from this pledge. And now, because of the covenant which ye have made, ye shall be called the children of Christ, his sons and his daughters. For behold, this day he hath spiritually begotten you. For ye say that your hearts are changed through faith on his name. Therefore ye are born of him, and have become his sons and his daughters, spiritually. The Son of God has a perfect right to call us his children, spiritually begotten. And we have a perfect right to look on him as our Father, who spiritually begot us. What does this teach us? That it is possible for Christ to be both the Son and the Father to us. And in one sense, he is our spiritual Father. President Smith also demonstrates that this passage isn't about Heavenly Father and Jesus at all. Father and Son in these verses aren't being used as names to refer to two different people. They're being used as titles to describe different roles that one man, Jesus Christ, plays. Just like every boy is born as a son, and when he grows up, gets married, and has children, he becomes a father. And although he is now a father, he is still and will always be a son to his parents. Therefore, he is both father and son. But is there more to this than that? After all, Abinadi gives far too long and confusing an explanation to be trying to convey something so simple. Sometimes in the scriptures, we have to work backward. A prophet will make a basic, albeit confusing statement, but in the verses around that statement, we'll find a key that we can plug into that statement to help it make more sense. We found an example of this in the Book of Mormon Week 7 video with DNC section 19 verses 6 through 12. The key Abinadi gives us to help us understand what he's talking about is down in verse 5, thus the flesh becoming subject to the spirit, or the son to the father. It seems that the terms father and son aren't being used literally here, they're symbolic. If the word son symbolizes the weakness of the mortal flesh, whereas father symbolizes the power of the spirit, how does that change our perception of Abinadi's message? What exactly is Abinadi trying to get across here? 
Let's try an experiment. Every time we see the word sun, let's replace it with the flesh or something along those lines. And every time we see father, replace it with the spirit and see how that changes our understanding of what's being taught. The point of this part of Abinadi's message is to teach these priests and leaders who reportedly believe in the law of Moses that God himself shall come down among the children of men and shall redeem his people. Now, in verse 2, he clarifies that because Jesus will come down and dwell in the flesh, he shall be called the Son of God. His mortality will make him son, because son here represents mortal flesh. Now, having subjected the flesh to the will of the Father. Well, if son represents the mortal flesh and father represents the power of the spirit, then subjecting his flesh to the will of the Father could mean that his mortal flesh is subjected to the power of the spirit. And he did that, didn't he? In order to live a perfect sinless life, his flesh at all times would have to be perfectly subject to the power of his spirit. In 1862, Brigham Young spoke on our state of existence here on earth. This state is a state of trial, wherein the spirit clothed upon with flesh labors to sanctify, redeem, and save the flesh, that in the resurrection the spirit and the body may be made eternally one through the power of the atonement and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Mosiah 15, 2-3 reiterates the Son to Father, flesh to spirit analogy. Christ had the power of the spirit because he was conceived by the power of God, and yet he was clothed in mortality, suffering as a mortal would suffer because he had taken upon him the mortal flesh. Thus he became both father and son, or both power of spirit and mortal flesh. Perhaps Abinadi's purpose here was to teach that Jesus would come down and take on mortality, yet he would still be God and would still wield the power of God, because as verse 4 points out, and they are one God, yea, the very eternal father of heaven and of earth. I wish we knew what questions or points he was addressing here. It would be helpful to have the other half of the conversation. Verse 5 takes on a different feel, to me at least. And thus the flesh becoming subject to the spirit, or the son to the father, being one God, suffereth temptation, and yieldeth not to temptation, but suffereth himself to be mocked and scourged, and cast out and disowned by his people. I find it helpful to figure out which phrases only add extra information and take them out so we can more clearly see the core of what's being said. We know, or the Son to the Father being one God, is a reminder of what was said before, so let's take that out. And thus the flesh, becoming subject to the Spirit, suffereth temptation, and yieldeth not to temptation, but suffereth himself to be mocked, and scourged, and cast out, and disowned by his people. What's the point here? He suffers temptation and yields not to it, but suffers himself to be mocked and scourged, all because his mortal flesh is subject to the spirit. Let's put ourselves in the Savior's shoes. If I was being mocked and scourged, and I knew that I had the power to make it stop, how tempting would it be for me to wield that power? I wonder how much his mortal flesh cried out to his spirit, how can you let this happen? You can do something, make it stop. And yet, Although he knew he had the power and he could make it stop, he didn't. He let it happen. He put up no fight as he was betrayed by his own people, mocked and crucified. Of his death, verse 7 explains, The flesh becoming subject even unto death, the will of the Son being swallowed up in the will of the Father. Keeping with the analogy, the will of the mortal flesh being swallowed up in the will of the power of the Spirit. He lived a life in which his weak flesh was perfectly subject to the power of the Spirit. Through this, he was able to break the bands of death, and he was able to make intercession for us. To intercede means to intervene between parties with a view to reconciling differences, to mediate. And what gives him this power? He has ascended into heaven with bowels filled with mercy and compassion. We talked about the power of his empathy in week 14. The empathy he gained during his mortal life, his compassion and mercy, allows him to judge us more perfectly, while the power of God he wields allowed him to break the bands of death, take upon him our sins, and redeem us, satisfying the demands of justice. What was Abinadi's message? 
I think he was trying to teach in detail the dualistic nature of the Savior, how he could indeed take on mortal flesh while wielding the power of God, how he could wield the power of God to break the bands of death, yet also resist the urge to use that power when it came to what he needed to suffer in order to take our sins and our infirmities upon himself and to gain the empathy to make him the perfect judge. Christ's mortal life was one big balancing act, gauging when to use the power of God and when to resist the urge to do so. I wonder if that wasn't the biggest temptation he faced. He had the power. He could have used it to make life a lot easier, but he didn't. In fact, think back to when Satan tempted him in the wilderness. Every temptation involved misusing his power in one way or another wasting his power on parlor tricks like turning stone to bread, risky behavior, taking for granted the fact that the angels won't let him come to harm, and denying his heavenly power in exchange for earthly power. But these are just my fish flakes on Mosiah 15, one possible explanation for a confusing set of verses. Don't take my word for it. Go through it yourself. Look at what the prophets have said on the subject, or whatever stands out to you in your reading this week, and see what you think. Let me share a few quick, unrelated points that stood out to me. I gotta advocate for Zenith. In Mosiah chapter 11 verses 1 through 2 and 5, we learn a little more about the kind of person he was. He really wasn't a bad guy. He kept the commandments of God, and he consecrated priests of such a high caliber that his wicked son Noah felt the need to replace them with ones that were lifted up in the pride of their hearts. But once again, we see that Zenith lacked foresight. Just like last week, when his zeal blinded him to the trap that the king of the Lamanites set to bring the Nephites into bondage. In these chapters, Zenith's lack of foresight is made plain when he gives the kingdom to a wicked son, who changes the affairs of the kingdom, heavily taxes the people, and leads a life of luxurious wickedness. Zenith wasn't a bad guy, but I get the impression he wasn't close enough to the spirit, and his people suffered both temporally and spiritually because of it. This is another reason why we need to stay close to the Holy Ghost. The Holy Ghost can aid us with the insight, wisdom, and judgment we need to make good decisions if we'll develop that relationship with him, because that's his job, and he's really good at it, too. And what is wisdom? In Mosiah 12:27, Abinadi reminds King Noah and his priests, Ye have not applied your hearts to understanding, therefore ye have not been wise. Wisdom is applying our hearts to understanding. How do our hearts help us learn? We read in D&C 8:2, Yea, behold, I will tell you in your mind and in your heart by the Holy Ghost, which shall come upon you and which shall dwell in your heart. What I take from Abinadi's message here is that it's not enough for us to simply read the scriptures and try to analyze and understand them intellectually. True wisdom comes from understanding them with our hearts by heeding the promptings of the Holy Ghost. The final thing that stood out to me was Mosiah 13, 29 through 30. And now I say unto you that it was expedient that there should be a law given to the children of Israel, yea, even a very strict law, for they were a stiff-necked people, quick to do iniquity, and slow to remember the Lord their God. Therefore there was a law given them, yea, a law of performances and of ordinances, a law which they were to observe strictly from day to day, to keep them in remembrance of God and their duty towards Him. I found myself thinking, if the children of Israel had the law of Moses to keep them in daily remembrance of God and their duty towards him, what is our equivalent? What are we doing to keep him in daily remembrance? Let's consider one more verse as we ponder that. Mosiah 16.9 reminds us, He is the light and the life of the world, yea, a light that is endless that can never be darkened, yea, and also a life which is endless, that there can be no more death. How is he the light of the world? He gives us hope, sets the example we should follow, and also I thought of the light his doctrine sheds on our hearts and understanding. I want you to ponder, how is he a light to you? How is he the life of the world? We mentioned earlier that he broke the bands of death. I think also of the purpose and meaning that living his gospel gives us as breathing new life into us. I want you to ponder, 
How is he life to you? With these things in mind, I challenge you to ask yourself, what can you do to daily keep in remembrance how he is the light and the life to you? Find one way you can act on this testimony to bring you closer to the Savior. I hope today's video was helpful, if nothing else to give you a possible new angle to approach Mosiah 15 from. If in your study you find a neat prophetic quote you want to share with us, you can post it on the Drakestone Aquarium Facebook page. Next week covers Mosiah 18 through 24. Enjoy your feast upon the words of Christ, and remember, we are all brothers and sisters in our Heavenly Father's family. We're in this together.